Good afternoon, David. Thank you for joining us here at the uh, Canadian Orchid Congress. I'm Marlene Young, and I'm really thrilled to um, have David Lafarge from France with us. David has uh, a very impressive background in plant biology, genetics, and plant physiology. Uh, he is associated with the uh, Lorchidophile magazine and is editor-in-chief. And you can see from his bio that he's written several articles as well as a book on Phalaenopsis. So, David, uh, a, a very, very warm welcome to Canada, one. And two, uh, we very much appreciate you being here. Uh, and if you want to elaborate a little bit on your background, I'll turn the floor over to you. Thank you for okay. being here. Thank you, Marlene. Uh, thanks for the Canadian Orchid Congress to invite me for that webinar. So, um, I did my studies mainly about plant biology, genetics, and plant physi physiology at the University of Bordeaux. Um, and my graduation studies were mainly focused on the grapevine disease and how to how to reduce the, the fungicides we use for the grapevine culture. So after that, I worked for the French Society of Horticulture, where I participated to a program about reduction of pesticides for the private gardens. And now I work on for the Mola bookstore in Bordeaux, which is the largest independent French bookstore run for the by the same family for 120 years this year. So, um, talking about orchids, I do add my first orchid at the age of 12, and so this was a very classic Oncidium, a yellow one, that died really quickly, and so that gave me the the real will to, to know how to to run the orchids and to grow them. So after that, I do take a lot of time for this passion, and I went to queue for a short period um, before entering university uh, when I was 18. This was supported by the Charles de Gaulle bursary scheme for the British Council and the French Orchid Society. I then published quite a lot of articles for different journals like L'Orchidophile in French, Orchids for the AOS, and the Orchidin journal in uh, German. So I am the manager of the editorial board for now four years, so since 2012, and I published a book that is available on ebook and mainly on the iTunes store. And this book has been translated greatly by Marlene Young. So thank you, Marlene, again. So before talking about the blue phalaenopsis, I'd like to introduce the blue in the gardening and horticulture. So that's what I called 50 shades of blue. So you can see the reference. Um, so, blue is a highly variable color when you talk about flowers. Basically, in the flower world, the blue is more a light purple. So, you don't have a lot of flowers that are truly blue, as you can see on papers or paintings. But mainly, they are lavender or with a discreet purple in it when it's visible. And that's what we call blue in the flower world. So the true blue is really rare, but horticulturists did select a lot of blue forms for the garden because the blue is highly desirable. So here are a few examples of different plants and flowers with a blue tint. So the first one, which is a poppy, is a real blue flower with yellow inside for the, for the pollen. You then have then have something of the gentianaceae family, and different flowers like iris or myosotis or yacinths. Here are a few more examples with a blue hydrangea first, then different flowers. This flower, which is 
but pretty is related to the potato family. You then have a pelargonium, um, a morning flower, and clemat clematis. So you can see with those few pictures in the last two slides that the blue color is really variable and we could call all those flowers blue even if the the shades are really different and can change a lot. So when we talk about orchids we can find only a few species that can be considered really blue but many varieties are lavender or what we call cerulea in Latin words. So cerulea is the word for the lavender color in Latin. Those cerulea varieties are highly regarded by orchid growers as they are fairly rare and usually you have different um, kind of plants. So you have the regular variety and a cerulea one which is highly regarded. And as this is highly regarded, orchid people often call blue or cerulea what is only lightly purple or with a very small amount of purple on the pink background. That's because uh, most of the time you can sell the cerulea varieties for a much higher price than the regular one. So it's sometimes easy to, to call blue what is not really blue. So we'll have a few examples of blue orchids now. So we begin with the the real blue orchids. So we will have three species. The first one is this Australian terrest terrestrial blue orchid called Telemetra crinita, which is a beautiful orchid. Uh, as you can see, it's real blue shade on the petals and sepals. Um, petals and sepals are really similar and even the lip of this flower here is really similar to the petals. So you can see a simple flower for orchid world um, and so it's a small terrestrial plant from Australia and it flowers only after uh, a fire burns down the soil and the trees so it's really difficult to maintain in cultivation. Other terrestrial blue orchids that follows comes from South Africa, so it's rather a similar ecosystem as in Australia, so Mediterranean conditions and climate uh, in South Hemisphere. So this is Daisa borei, and then you have Daisa graminifolia. The two of them were before that were in the genus Erskelia, but have been moved in the Dysa genus. So you can see that this last Dysa is yet a bit purple on the lip mainly, and even the petals and the sepals have purple hint in it and not truly blue, but even though they are still really desirable and great, but they are really difficult to maintain in cultivation and so that's not the, the easiest house orchid you can have. Here are a few epiphytes that are called blue in the orchid world. So the first one is Venda cerulea, which is the most famous blue orchid we, you can find to cultivate. So you can see that even in this form, which is highly selected and has been line bred, um, this is a really nice purple and lavender hint, but you not uh, find the, the real blue shade in it. But it's even highly de desirable. Um, here is the, the pink variety of Vandasarelia, which is indeed the most looked after because this is the rare form and not the, the blue one is the is the common one. And the pink one is the is the fairly uncommon. So that's quite a counter example to what happens usually with blue orchids. Here is a Lelia Diana. It's now called Cattleya Diana after changing in systematics. So this is the Cerulea variety. This is the Shojamaru clone. And you can see that it's barely, barely purple. It's fairly a pink orchid with a few purple pigments that give the cerulea variety. 
Here you have Cattleya purpurata variety cerulea. So this picture is from Henry Oakley. And you can see that it's really bluish and lavender. But even though it's not what we can call a true blue flower. Here is another example with Dendrobium Victoria Regine with a picture from Greg Alicas. And uh, it's a great picture. Uh, you can see that. This flower is really lovely and has a, a beautiful lavender to purple hint and it's really good looking but still not a true blue. Even on the bud, it's more obvious that you have a lot of red pigments in those flowers. So that was for the, the orchid world and blue color, but what about Phalaenopsis? So no species of Phalaenopsis is naturally blue. You can't find a blue Phalaenopsis in the wild. You, though, have some varieties that can be cerulea. And those varieties and blue color are highly priced among the Phalaenopsis growers and lovers. Uh, you know, some Phalaenopsis are, growers are really fanatics, so they do look for different varieties, so the Alba varieties, the Cerulea ones. And breeders work hard on those blue files. Here are a few examples. The first one is Phalaenopsis lowei, which, which is uh, quite an unusual Phalaenopsis with this uh, procedium which looks like an elephant trump, and that gave the name the group of Phalaenopsis it belongs, which are called Proboscioides, and it's the Greek for Latin tramp. Here you can see the, the regular variety, which has a pink lip and a pink stain on the petals and sepals. And here is the, on the, on the right, is the cerulear variety with um, a fairly blue lip, but the, the rest of the flower is fairly white with uh, a little purple on staining on the base of the petals and sepals. The, the blue variety of Phalaenopsis lowei is really rare and highly prized for everyone who grows orchids. This is another example with a miniature and deciduous Phalaenopsis, uh, which is Phalaenopsis tinealis. So on the top, on the small image, you have the normal variety, which is pink and with a, a darker lip. And the cerulea variety is really this purple flower with a purple lip and quite like light lavender petals and sepals. So this species is not easy to grow as it's a deciduous and miniature. So you have to turn a greenhouse to, to grow it properly or a terrarium. Because if you try to, to housekeep it, it will be very difficult to maintain the high level of humidity and to, to give the, the cold winter it, uh, it needs to flower well. Here is another miniature Phalaenopsis. It's Phalaenopsis appendiculata. This is the smallest flower in the genus. It's, it reaches barely one centimeter in diameter, but even less usually. So you have the normal variety on the left with the pink flowers, you know, this pink patterned flower. And on the right, you have what is called a cerulea appendiculata, even if it's barely violet or purple. You know, maybe that's just a picture can alter the color and, and gives this bluish and purplish uh, hint of color. But it's not really impressive as uh, a different shade of color. One most in more interesting species for breeding and for blue colors in Phalaenopsis is Phalaenopsis pulcherima. It used to be called Doritis pulcherima before Eric Christensen decided to to review the genus and to, to merge Doritis into Phalaenopsis. So on the left, you have an example of the, the wild type uh, Phalaenopsis pulcherima with different mealybugs on the, on the stem usually, but it does attract a lot of mealybugs. Uh, and so on the top, you have a cerulea variety, and on the right, you have this really interesting plan because um, 
it's a real dark purple and bluish color and really solid color. So that's really a shame because the plant died since I, I got that, but it was awarded um, quite a lot of time. So hopefully I gave some some of the part and divisions to, to different friends, which means that the plant still exists. There is another interesting species, still with small flowers, it's Phainopsis equestris. So it's known to have a lot of different color varieties. The, the wild type is this flower with small flowers, quite really a bit too opened and reflexed petals looking behind the, behind the, the flower and with a very nice pink lip with a yellow callus on the base of the lip, which you can see with red or orange punctuation. And there is one vari variety with uh, a bluish lip, which is called the cyanochilus variety. So you still have those beautiful yellow with red dots colors and um, a purple to blue lip midlobe and uh, a very light lavender hint on the column and the sepals and petals. So that's an interesting plant because Phainopsis equestris grows quite f fast and so it flowers quickly when you it get out of flask and that's an interesting plant for breeding. The third really interesting species is Phainopsis violacea because there has been a lot of line breeding within the species with eye selection of the of the natural form. Here you have the pink form and here is the bluish to lavender color form of the Phainopsis uh, variacea with a dark purple lip. So the sister species Phainopsis bellina is also interesting because you can find some varieties with blue or purple color instead of the pink usual color and the mix of blue and green or pink and green is really interesting and this plant is really nicely scented. So that's another good point about this, that species. So after those Violacea, speaking of those, um, an interesting story is the, that flask that Michael Owey, a famous Phainopsis grower in Malaysia, gave to H.P. Norton after a visit. So he gave him a flask as a souvenir, but H.P. Uh, Norton didn't notice anything special about that flask and he made them flowers, flower and so the plants were really interesting because of the shape and they were nicely colored, so H.P. Norton decided to, to use this flask for his line breeding. And after a time and uh, many years of selection and breeding, he gave uh, one of the flasks for uh, an international Phainopsis Alliance, the IPA auction, where one of the flasks were so, was sold for $80. And so the people that bought this flask for $80 were told they were crazy to spend such an amount of money for a simple Violacea flask. So I'm, I suppose that they were happy to, to donate for the IPA, but. Anyway, that seemed to be a lot of money for that species in the flask. But after a few months, they flowered one of the one of those plants in the flask, and they had a big surprise because the color of the flower was solid, and there were <coughs> a dark lavender purple flower, and other flowers were solid pink or magenta. And so I'm, I suppose that H.P. Norton asked them to, to give back this plan because it was just an amazing thing. But I'm sure that they, they shared something, but maybe the, the people did keep the flower and I think that they were really happy with their $80 spent on the flask for that. So we'll see the picture. Here is the picture of the Norton flask plant, so that's a really solid and impressive color for Violacea and it's really differentiated from the normal form. You have other example with somewhat lighter color, but the photo may have an influence of the co on the color you, you see. So this plant was awarded an AM by the AOS uh, quite recently. 
But the problem is that when you cross two of the blue Norton flowers, you usually get a lot of those magenta flowers and a very small amount of the blue Norton line flowers. So that's one of the limits of the line breeding is that you cannot fix the, the blue color. You, you always have that pink color that comes back and we don't know a lot about the genetics of phalaenopsis, but that may be something that regulates the color that doesn't go through the progeny and that is not inherited. So that's one of the limits of those notons. So here is for the the blue line breeding phalaenopsis and as you see the noton is quite a milestone and and a new a new milestone that has been reached. The other way to get blue phalaenopsis is to, is to breed for blue hybrids. So you can just select a few of the cellular varieties with normal, with other cellular varieties and to, to make crosses. So you have different lines with that, but mainly novelties and small flowered phalaenopsis and miniature. As you saw, um, there is a few flower, few species that has a cerulea variety. So you don't have the big flowers and the, the flat flowers. It's mainly the star-shaped flowers and the small ones like the former Doritis. So you can't have standard blue phalaenopsis hybrids to date with those plants. Here are a few examples. Um, actually, the, the old blue phalaenopsis or so are represented here. So the first one was phalaenopsis siam treasure. Um, so it's an hybrid between Polkerima and Lowei. You can find a lot of Lowei remaining, mainly the short elephant trunk here, or the lip, which is quite similar. And uh, the general shape is rather similar to the, the low AI plant. So this is interesting because you have the blue hint of the Pulcherima and low AI varieties and it's much more easy to grow uh, that compared to the, to the classic low AI. And as I said before, the, the blue low AI is really rare and so it's easier to, to get a CM treasure. Another interesting blue hybrid was this Phalaenopsis purple gem, which is Equestris crossed with Polkerima again. Um, so it's interesting because it's really free flowering like the Equestris plants and it has that really solid and more intense color that is inherited from Polkerima plants. The other hybrid that is really interesting in the blue stain is this uh, Phalaenopsis canef Schubert, which is Pulcherima again with Violacea. As you see, those three hybrids have Pulcherima in the background because Pulcherima is quite easy to grow and does transmit a lot to the progeny and mainly transmit the color. So here you can see there is the lip is quite characteristic of um, the Violacea progeny with the yellow lateral lobes of the lip. You can see just behind the column and above the, the purple and really dark purple uh, lip. So this flower is interesting, but the problem is that uh, Phalaenopsis pulcherima has an erect inflorescence habit and Violacea has a small, short and pending uh, inflorescence habit. So the mix between the two is somewhat problematic and some of the inflorescences of Kenneth Schubert are quite misformed or deformed. So that was one of the problems with this plant. But as you see, it's quite difficult to breed blue phalaenopsis, so you, are, you can't find another solution. and the efforts were failed to bring blue in uh, standard white phalaenopsis and high quality standard phalaenopsis. So the Dutch growers did find an, an, an alternative way to, to make a blue easy to reach hybrid and with big flowers and big flat round flowers. Here is what they do. Um, they use a classic standard white round flower phalaenopsis with methylene blue which is a chemical which is highly colored with dark blue and it's really staining and really you can, even with a small amount of blue powder, you get a lot of blue water. So what they do is just that they inject this 
product in the inflorescence. So the pigment goes through the veins and gets to the flowers. So here is the result. It's quite impressive, but even if it really artificial flowers. So here you can see there's a lot of those blue flowers in a greenhouse in the Netherlands. Um, so the problem is that even if it's quite seducing and attractive at the first sight for those who don't mind artificial color, uh, after a few days or a few weeks of flowering, the pigment is moving in the flower. So it's concentrating in the lip and on the edges of the petals and sepals and you see heavily marked veins that are carrying the pigment. So this is really not a good aesthetic. And as you can see the stem here is even stained in blue and the back of the flower is also heavily stained. So the balance is not really proper to, to have a good flower condition. So that's the main problem with this technique and this method is that it's not lasting a lot and it's moving through time. The other big problem is that with those plants, when you reflower them, they do white flowers and the blue is not constitutive to the plant. So the next flowerings will be white only. And that's uh, highly deceptive for the customers who buy some blue phalaenopsis and wants a blue one and at the, at the next flowering they only get the white classic phalaenopsis so that's a bit disappointing for them. So as I said those flowers are not really blue they are just stained with a blue pigment so that's fading and the flowering is much shortened by the by the chemicals and the next flowering will give white flowers which is quite disappointing and one of the other problems is that the plant can suffer with those injections. You know, it can transmit bacteria, fungi, and the chemical itself is, is hurting to the plant. And the other big issue could be that you can transmit viruses um, because as you use the same syringe to inject all the plants and you, you can transmit really quickly the virus to all the batch of plants you, you are injecting with the, with the blue. So that's a big problem and that can't be a real solution but for the just for the mass market and for one one shot use flowers and then you just throw it but you can't really cultivate those blue phalaenopsis at home. So what's the situation? The line breeding has led to the northern lines and it won't lead to to something much better I suppose or it would be a big surprise if something else happens like the blue northern happened. So it's quite the, the highest thing we will reach with line breeding. And uh, the standard wild phalaenopsis are often difficult to breed further with new species or novelties. Because when you breed uh, high standard phalaen white phalaenopsis with a species or a novelty, you sometimes and often reduce the quality of the shape and the, and the flatness and roundness of the flowers. So that's not the best solution to use those big white phalaenopsis as parents with other spe with species. And it would take a very long time to breed blue standard phalaenopsis with this method because you need a lot of generations to get that and to reach that goal. So. The next step was the use of biotechnologies. Those biotechs are more and more easy to use today and they come fairly cheap to use and quite easy. So you can study the genes and use the biotechs to, to help you in the in the horticulture world or in agronomy, you know. So the biotechs are more and more powerful and maybe that those biotechs can help with orchid industry to, to reach new goals and new horizons. So here is a small flower that grows in the mountains in Japan. It's called Comelina communis and as its name stands for communis, it's really common. Um, so it's a very nice small flower in the family of Tradescantia. It's really easy to grow and it has been studied a lot by scientists because the stomata, which are the organ that permits the plant to breathe 
and to exchange gas with the atmosphere are really big on these plants and so you can even see some of them with naked eyes. So that was a model for scientists who, who studied the stomata. But as it was a, a lab plant, they also studied the complex pigment accumulation in the flowers because it was very, very interesting to know which genes were implicated in the, that very very lovely blue color. So they really studied it and identified all the genes that were implicated in that blue color. So that was really interesting because that flower gave a bank of genes, you know, and so it was easy to, to get one of the genes and to use it for something else. And in Japan, the blue color is really related to the to their everyday life. And so it's important for them to, to get blue things and blue blue food is quite un unusual. So it was interesting for them to, to make something blue for food. So the first thing they did was this blue watermelon. As you can see, they used the, the blue gene of Comelina communis and they put it in a watermelon, so the watermelon appears blue now. And that's the same taste of a, a regular watermelon, but blue, so the Japanese were quite fond of that. And the next step of, that, of the biotech in Japan was to, to get this blue into a phalaenopsis. So here is the result of it. So they took a white phalaenopsis with small flowers, and they bred they, they just inserted the, the blue gene of Comelina communis in the genome of in the genetic material of this phalaenopsis and here is what they get they got. Um, it's a really blue phalaenopsis even if it's some somewhat a bit purple but it's even bluer that than any of the other phalaenopsis ever bred before. So that was really interesting. And so here is the presentation of the plants in, the, in Japan a few years ago. So here are vaulted glass protection boxes because they don't want anyone to pick pollen or a part of the plant and clone it before, before they reached themselves um, the way to, to reproduce and to greatly reproduce those plants. So you know the two really impressive genetically modified Phalaenopsis, and that's a really interesting plant and a new horizon that is opening towards us. So what's for now and the future? As Phalaenopsis is the most pot plant sold in the world now, even more than any other pot plant or interior gardening plant, it has a very high commercial potential. And uh, the blue flowers are so desirable that a blue phalaenopsis would be really like a jackpot thing for anyone that would be able to do it. So the development of this genet genetically modified phalaenopsis would be really interesting in terms of money and market. But one of the questions is that will this genetically modified phalaenopsis will breed true with other species or different lines? Because maybe if you do that, you can breed with standard phalaenopsis now, and that would be a big break in the in the work for a big flower round shaped uh, phalaenopsis with the blue color. So here is where we are now, and that was about the blue phalaenopsis. So I'll ask a few words before leaving you and answering questions. Um, a little bit of advertisement for the French Orchid Society. So we publish quarterly uh, French-speaking journal. It's about 100 pages, so 400 pages a year, a full color, and it speaks about cultivation, protection, conservation, and knowledge about all the orchids, European terrestrial orchids, and uh, the tropical epiphytic cultivation. So you're welcome to visit our website. And the other thing I want to advocate for is the Paris European Orchid Congress in March 2018. So it will take place from the 23rd to 25th of March in the Paris Porte de la Villette. And 
there will be a scientific congress, an international show with many international growers and vendors, uh, French orchids discovery tours uh, after the, the congress, a botanical art fair and competition, a photo competition that will be organized with a cannon, so there will be interesting prizes to win. And there will also be an international hybrid, hybrid show, so if you have not registered hybrids to present, you're really welcome because the Truffaut company will select one and will sell this plant in all the, the shops Truffaut in Europe and that's quite an interesting deal. So thank you for your attention and I'm waiting for your questions now. Thank you, David. That was absolutely fascinating. <laughs> it's uh, quite an accomplishment and the flowers are gorgeous. Now I have a couple of questions for you. Uh, we have one here that uh, we have a viewer that wants to know why you can't adjust the pH levels for um, for orchids the way you do for hydrangeas. If you have if I have a an hydrangea, I can play with the pH levels in the soil and by increasing it go from pink to blue color. Why doesn't this work for orchids? Uh, actually what you do with hydrangea is adapting the pH from about 6 to 8 or 9 or so and uh, so because the pigment which is blue can change color depending on the acidity and the pH level. So that's a solution for a plant that grows in soil and that can adapt because you can fix the chlorosis problem with iron supply or some things. But with Phyanopsis it doesn't work because Phyanopsis don't grow well at a pH that is above 7. You know, the, the very good pH for Phyanopsis is only 6, so you can't really play with that part of the thing. So that's why it doesn't work for Phyanopsis. Okay, that, make, that makes a lot of sense. And in your presentation, you mentioned that some orchid terrestrials were more blue, but the epiphytes, epiphytes didn't seem to have that blue uh, color. Uh, why is that? Is, is it because the soil is impacting the blue color on the terrestrials? Oh, actually, that's a very good question. I, I don't have the, the real answer because I never found such a study on the difference between terrestrial and, and epiphytes in color. But I think that maybe the soil has a role to play, but mainly I suppose that's a problem of evolution and with the pollinator relationship because you find a lot of terrestrial small plants in Mediterranean neon climates that are blue or so. And so I think that those orchids share the pollinator with those non-orchid plants and that's maybe why they have been selected by evolution. That, so maybe that's the answer but I'm not sure. And I have another one for you. Um, the dyed blue orchids that uh, hit the market, it, it was easy enough for the judging community to dismiss these um, these blue dyed orchids from the judging process because the process was artificial and it was temporary but now how are the how is the judging community going to deal with the the GMO phalaenopsis and any other orchids that are going to be entering the judging system yeah uh that's really interesting because we don't know how to do with the judging of those modified plants but indeed it was easy with the stained plants because it's temporary and really artificial and the plant doesn't flower blue naturally or on itself but with the modified genetically modified phyanopsis the question is really different I suppose that we have to judge them as the other phyanopsis or other plants because what we do when we hybridize the plants is mixing the genes of different species and with modifi uh, genetically modified species plants you do the same you just bring new genes in another species so I think that we have to deal with them the same as with hybrids and maybe that's the future. And even further, if you cross those 
genetically modified plants with other plants, it will be very difficult to tell where the blue color comes from because it will mix for generations and progeny and so maybe we will just get used to that and judge the plants just regularly, I suppose. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make life interesting for all of us, but that's why we are doing orchids, isn't it? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. yeah, I'm sure that will be really interesting to see what happens now. Well, David, I can't thank you enough. That was an absolutely enlightening um, presentation. And again, I thank you for joining us on behalf of the Canadian Orchid Congress. And have a safe trip home. Yeah, thank you so much, Molly.